I want to talk about The Tempest, which I consider the twin play of King Lear. Uh, and as before, I said about King Lear, this is a reading of The Tempest. It's not the meaning of The Tempest, which can be uh, seen in a lot of different ways because Shakespeare was such a great artist that his plays are like life. You can interpret it in different ways. So you remember that uh, King Lear is a total tragedy. It's the tragedy of a regime ending before the people, the next people are ready to take it over, which is why I compared it to this time uh, when the regime of the baby boomers is basically coming to an end. The lives of the baby boomers are coming to an end, uh, but there's no one to replace them because no one has been taught the way to go forward. Uh, and if you remember um, th that what we saw in this was that as the regime uh, crumbled, the culture uh, fell away and people were reduced to a state of nature. And we found out that th that's not a good thing, that culture is an expression of the human soul. And, uh, and so what happens is that King Lear, who tries to hold on to his daughters, his three daughters' love, uh, insists that they love only him and tell him that they love him above all things. And he tries to hold on to his kingly power. Even as it's slipping away, he is slowly reduced uh, to nothing to the state of nature. And the center of the play, as I pointed out, uh, the kind of moral center of the play, if you will, is where he has finally lost all his power, lost all his loves. Uh, he is nothing. He's standing on a heath in a storm, impotently pretending, thinking that he is controlling, that he's giving orders to nature when obviously nature is completely indifferent to him as a human being. So I'm just going to play that scene, which I didn't play last time. Here is uh, Laurence Olivier playing King Lear out in the, on the heath in the storm, one of the most famous scenes in all of literature. This is cut four. Blow winds and crack your cheeks. Rage flow, you pestilence and hurricanes. Spout, and you have drenched our people round the cocks. You sulfurous and thought executing fires, more curious to oak creaming thunderbolts, singe my white head. And thou, all quaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the world. <laughs> strike flat the thick roots under the world. He's given orders to nature, which, of course, we realize nature could care less, and he is just a, an old man out in a storm. So now the tempest starts, and where does the tempest start? It starts with a storm, right? And it's a terrible storm at sea on a ship, and on that ship is a king, the king of Naples and his counselor. Uh, and they are arguing with the bosun who's trying to keep the ship uh, together, uh, and the bosun says, get away from here. He says, what cares these roarers, the waves that are going to take the, the uh, ship down? He says, what care these roarers for the name of king? And he says, if you can command, he says to his counselor, if you can command these elements to silence then I'll stop working the boat. In other words, we have to do the practical stuff. You have no power over nature. So it's the same scene, essentially. And it's as if, if you think about it, uh, the plot line of Lear, which is going through, you know, the plot line goes through event and event and event, uh, and is heading off to this terrible tragedy. It's as if suddenly the plot line had gone off into the multiverse. Another version of this plot, an alternative version of this plot, had gone into the Tempest. I have to pause here for just a minute, just to have an out total tangent. Uh, my favorite line in the storm scene is when somebody compares a boat, says a boat is as leaky as an unstaunched wench, uh, meaning a, a girl who's having her period but doesn't have anything to stanch it with, doesn't have a, a sanitary cloth uh, to stanch it. And I always love this in Shakespeare, is in the midst of this high poetry, is always this incredible earthiness. And I just think of what will the sensitivity editors who have destroyed uh, Ian Fleming and destroyed Roald Dahl and want to destroy Agatha Christie, what would they make of an unstinted witch? Uh, you know, it always makes me laugh in the 19... Uh, 36 movie of Romeo and Juliet, which is after the Hayes office, the censors come in. There's a line in that, and I'm quoting this from memory, so it won't be right, but there's a line where Mercutio uh, says something about a woman, uh, her quivering thighs, and the domain adjacent thereto. In other words, her her sex. And uh, I always think, well, the Hayes office probably didn't understand the, the uh, Elizabethan English there. Uh, so I, I always love those moments. All right. But that's just my own little grotesque uh, tangent. Uh, so 
Same point as the King Lear scene, this, it opens with the Heath scene, the storm scene, except it's different. Uh, so we've gone off on a multiverse tangent into an alternative version of this. And what do we? What happens? The ship goes down and we cut to the magic island that they're near. Uh, where is the magician who's the lead of the show, Prospero? And he, we find out that he is doing it all. He's controlling the storm. He's made the storm. He's made the ship sink. He's made the people on the ship make it to safety when they otherwise would have been killed. So everything we've learned from King Lear and everything we've learned on this ship, that the king has no power, that man has no power over nature, that man can't control the elements, that man can't control life, life is out of control, suddenly is untrue. We have a magician who is controlling it all. And so we realize this, this alternate multiverse King Lear that we've gone into is the world of art, that this is an artist. The, he is, we are living in his imagination. And that means that when we see all the story that plays out, um, it, it, it's really info- unfolding in some way in his mind, right? It's what's called a psychomachy, uh, which is a battle uh, between the psychic elements and the single human mind. So it's a story about people, but at the same time, it can be read also as something that is going on in his imagination because everything that an artist creates comes out of his imagination. All his characters, men, women, good guys, bad guys, they're all him or her in some, in some way. And this is why uh, the tragedy the Tempest is not a tragedy like Kim King Lear. It's what's called a comedy of grace because it takes place out of the world, which is a tragic world, and it takes place in the artist's imagination. So to tell you the story very, very briefly, uh, Prospero, the magician, is an exiled duke of Milan. Uh, while he was reading in his books, he got so attend, uh, he got so um, hooked on the liberal arts and so focused on the liberal arts that his brother, uh, Antonio, stole his dukedom and became the Duke of Milan and had him exiled with the power of the King of Naples behind him. Uh, And they sent him off and he wound up by providence on this island living for 12 years with his daughter Miranda. And he's angry about it. Now his daughter is in her teens, very beautiful, lovely uh, maid, and he is angry about this. And now by providence, all his enemies, his brother, the king of Milan, have come by on the ship, and so he has shipwrecked them and brought them all to his island. And he's living uh, there where he controls all these spirits. There are two key spirits that he controls. One is named Ariel, uh, who is a kind of creative sprite, and one is named uh, Caliban, which is an anagram for cannibal, uh, who is a hunkering monster, right? He's the uh, child of a witch, uh, and he's this hunkering monster. And so you can almost think about it. It's a little simplistic, but you can think of Ariel as his spirit, and Caliban as his flesh, right? These are all parts of things in his mind. And uh, Prospero and Miranda treated Caliban kindly until Caliban tried to rape Miranda. He said, if I had succeeded, I would have popped, peopled the island with Calibans. He wanted to just make more of himself because that's what the flesh wants to do. Uh, and so Prospero uses Ariel to control all the people uh, on the island, and they're plotting against him. Uh, Caliban finds two drunkards and convinces them to kill Prospero. Uh, these other guys, uh, the Duke, the King of Naples and the Duke of Milan, his brother, are the people the Duke of, of Milan is plotting against the King of Naples. Uh, so there's all these plots going on, and Ariel is using spirits and effects and music and all this to control them all, because they're all taking place in the imagination of the artist. One of the people that he controls is the king of Naples' son, the prince of Naples, uh, who is named Ferdinand, and he comes to see Miranda. Prospero brings him to see Miranda, and the two of them fall madly in love with each other on the spot. So, if we know that nature is not our friend, but culture is man acting for good, basically is, is bringing morality and justice and mercy into the world, what do you expect Miranda's father to do when she meets the man she loves and he approves of him? That's what he does. He takes Ferdinand prisoner and begins to force him to work at slave labor in order to understand what Miranda is worth. So he doesn't want him to take her lightly. He wants to teach him, to train him in the cultural uh, norms and uh, restrictions that make marriage work. So he said, do you remember Do you remember Mr. Miyagi in uh, The Karate Kid? He makes him wax the car, wax on, wax off, and that movement of the hand becomes the first move of his karate. And the kid keeps saying, "What am I? why am I waxing your car? And he just says, just wax the car. That is what Uh, Prospero does to Ferdinand, the Prince of Naples, he forces him to carry wood. 
just ca- he's carrying wood. And he's just, you know, the, Ferdinand doesn't like this. He's a prince. He thinks he's the king because he thinks his father has drowned. And so he talks to Miranda. He's carrying this wood. And he says, I am in my condition a prince, Miranda. I do think a king. And I, the, he says, I would no more endure this wooden slavery than to suffer the fresh fly to blow in my mouth. Hear my soul speak. The very instant that I saw you, did my heart fly to your service. There resides to make me slave to it, and for your sake am I this patient logman. Uh, he is learning that love is worth serving. He is in service of love. Now, ultimately, when Ferdinand has learned this lesson and he's ready, Prospero says, here is my daughter, uh, and I want you to love them, love her. Uh, and he says, he, there's a t- ter- so he does the opposite of King Lear, King Lear who wants to hold on to all his daughter's love. He surrenders his daughter's love. Uh, but he says to Ferdinand, if thou dost break her virgin knot before all sanctimonious ceremonies may with full and holy right be ministered, then their marriage will be cursed. So stay to the culture. Keep, keep in the cultural norms that enforce morality. And so they, he agrees to this. He's not going to have sex with her before marriage. Uh, and he's teaching him, wax on, wax off. This is how you have a, uh, a, a moral marriage. So at, to celebrate their betrothal, he summons his spirits and he has uh, he puts on a show. Now, I have to explain something about marriage in a psychomachy and something that's going on in his head. It's not just two people getting together. It is also the male and female part of an individual human being coming together, the yin and yang. This is one of the things that transgenderism gets all wrong. We do all have part of the other sex in us. Of course we do. Uh, Men are are, uh, ambitious and aggressive, uh, but they want to have that uh, restraint on them. And and Shakespeare understands that this is what Christianity is. It is bringing those things together. That's why in uh, The Merchant of Venice, the person who makes the quality of mercy speech is Portia, a woman dressed as a man. And Shakespeare is saying there is an element of bringing the self together, uh, the yin and yang of a man together in Christianity. Uh, It's a huge subject, but just uh, it's something that happens in real life, that marriage gives you, uh, as, a, as a marriage, the two of you have the, that yin and yang together, and it helps you see the world in three dimensions instead of only two. And that's why we love one another instead of fight with one another and bring each other's ideas into our lives and not uh, keep them out. Um, so he puts on a show, bringing the spirits together, and he has the goddess uh, of uh, marriage, Juno, and the goddess of fertility series uh, all are portrayed, and Venus is there in absentia because uh, she's described, but she isn't there because they're not ready to have sex yet, so they don't have Venus there. And when the mask is over, uh, he, says, he sends the spirits away, and this is what he tells them. This is a very famous speech. It's sometimes referred to as Shakespeare's goodbye to the theater because the, the Tempest is the last play he ever wrote on his own, as far as we know. And this is what he says after the show. This is cut five. Our revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Beautiful, beautiful speech. Like I said, sometimes it's called Shakespeare's Goodbye to the Theater. What he's saying is, everything you just saw before you, this performance is vanishing just as life will vanish because this thing is taking place in his imagination and he's saying that life also lives in your imagination, which is what I keep telling you, that the the, the stone you knock your foot on, uh, the love that you feel, the beauty that you see, all of those are yours. They are yours. They are in, in collaboration with reality. They can be diluted and then you go astray, but if you see them right and if you train your mind to them, they are 
a creation of your mind, everything, all of the world. And the beautiful thing about this is when you get it right, when you get it right, that's, that's why uh, Coleridge felt that Jesus was the model for this. this. This was what he was showing you. This is how you get it right. And when you get it right, you have this beautiful life, even in sorrow, even in tragedy. And where does this all lead? He says, we are such sufferers, dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. And as we know, we do not know what dreams may come uh, after, after we sleep. But, but also, if we are dreamed, then someone must be dreaming us. We are such stuff as dreams are made of, so someone must be dreaming of us. We are living, it, we are part of the creation of another mind, a greater mind than ours. And that is the mind we are trying to imitate as we live. So, what does that look like? Well, the, the, all these villains who have ruined his life uh, come finally into Prospero's camp. And what does he do? He forgives them. And it's an amazing act, amazing act. Ariel says to him that you've got them charmed so strongly that if you saw them, uh, your affections would become tender. And Prospero says, do you think so? And Ariel says, mine would if I were human. And, and Prospero says, and mine shall, I, I shall, I will not punish them anymore, not one frown th- further, and he forgives them, he lets them go. And now the play comes to an end, uh, you know, with all the people reconciled and Prospero heading back to Milan to become Duke again, and he puts off all of his clothes and he had, approaches the audience and he says goodbye, and this is that speech, it's cut seven. Gentle breath of yours, my sails must fill, or else my project fails, which was to please. Now I want spirits to enforce, art to enchant, and my ending is despair, unless I be relieved by prayer, which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. As you from crimes would pardoned be, let your indulgence set me free. What he's saying at the end is that if you don't accept this play, I'm, I'm stuck here on this island because the play is over now and I'll never get off the island because the play has ceased unless the play continues in your mind, and he asks you to applaud, and then he'll know that he has pleased you, and the play will go on living with you. And he compares this to the forgiveness that he has shown. If you have taken his message of forgiveness and unifying yourself and and taking all the different parts of yourself and making them uh, into a unity, if you have taken that message in by bringing the play into yourself, then you become a creative person. The, The arts are there for you. They are there to school you in bringing all the disparate parts of yourself together, all the anger in yourself, uh, all the the people that you can't forgive, like your father and mother who become enemies in your mind, who are yelling at you in your mind. If you can let them go and bring them into a unity of self, you will be free. And he says, he compares this to forgiveness. Bringing yourself together is an act of forgiveness, just like forgiving the people outside. And he says, as as you from crimes would pardon be, let your indulgence, which is the Catholic means of getting forgiveness, set me free. And he wants you to set him to keep living in your mind. The tragedy of King Lear is still going to unfold in the outer world. History will remain tragic. Politics will remain tragic. But you are not a tragedy. Your inner life is not a tragedy, even in tragic circumstances. Your inner life is a journey through forgiveness and mercy into an inner life that looks like God's. It looks like yours specifically, your version of it, but it looks like God's. If you travel through truth and beauty and forgiveness, you will reach what is called in Christianity the kingdom of heaven. And mercy itself, he says, prayer pierces mercy itself. Mercy itself is God, and God is the one king whose reign never ends. And that's what The Tempest is about, about, and it takes place in an alternative version of history, of tragic history, which is you. For more Claveny fantabulositude, like and subscribe, and subscribe to The Andrew Claven Show wherever you get your podcasts.